Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as as the Bard of Philbar. Welcome to Session Fartook-33. In our last episode, the party managed to escape the captivity of the Crooked Guards and were magically teleported to the Church of Dilo. They learned that they were in the middle of a much larger problem that didn't concern them. Despite wanting to help the High Bishop and Dingus Overmeyer, they were convinced that they needed to leave town. As they gathered their pilfered belongings, they learned that they were about to be secreted out of Phoenix by none other than Johan the Lone Shark. We rejoin the party as they are incredulous at the thought. The High Bishop looked at Dingus who shrugged his shoulders as the quartet were yelling emphatically at the presence of Johan. The Ginger Dwarf calmly walked over to a side table and poured himself a glass of wine but winced at the taste. After several minutes of the group yelling, the High Bishop called for silence. Red-faced and angry, the adventurers retook their seats, exasperated. I understand that you have a grievance of some kind with Johan, said the priest, but the fact of the matter remains is, no one is more adept at removing items from the city without being caught. He has promised, on his beard no less, that no harm would befall you, and you can get out of town successfully. Still angry, the party members looked at each other with dubious confidence. A loud belch escaped the dwarf as he approached the seated delvers. Looky here, young ones. You don't like me, and I don't care about you. But that man, as he pointed to the high bishop, is paying me a considerable sum to get your worthless arses out of town. Since I don't get paid until I'm successful, I'll be making it so because I want the gold. If you don't want to go, you be costing me money. I suggest very strongly that you shut your yaps and you do as the god lover wants. The final remark caused Sister Elaine and the High Priest to both roll their eyes and Dingus stepped in front of the dwarf to address the party. He again explained that the group were already heroes and he didn't want to see that reputation tarnished. The citizens need something to believe in, and we are not strong enough to stop the corrupt forces from ruining you. You must go. Lady Irena and Cabe both pleaded their case on staying and helping to no avail. Finally, Fargus stepped up and got the group quiet again. He explained that their original plan was to go out onto the frontier and become adventurers. With a sarcastic note, he pointed out that the people of Phoenix no longer needed their services, and they could move on. Reluctantly, the other members of the group nodded, albeit grudgingly. Cabe Silvertongue inquired as to what the plan was, and both Dingus and the High Priest turned to Johan, who smiled broadly, stating one word, PIGS. The dwarf went on to explain that a cartload of swine was due in town from the North Ones, and that they would be making their way through town to the docks. Johan would make certain that the cart stopped by the sanctuary, and the group would hide in the center and would be ferried out to the docks. As they reached the channel, a small boat would allow them to get on to the far shore, and from there, they would be on their own to pursue life as they wished. Lady Irena was the first to protest about the mode of travel and stated she would not be traveling in a pig cart. She reluctantly agreed after Johan explained that the smelly ride was the most secure way to avoid any guard entanglements. The smell will keep many people from paying too much attention and would even cause most to avoid them. Their clean clothes would be provided to them once they got aboard the ship. It was only after the High Bishop pointed out that it was the safe way to get them out of the city. After huddling up and weighing their options, the group reluctantly agreed, which caused an exasperated Johan to exclaim, Finally! Arrangements were made for the group to spend the night in the church and get on the wagon at first light. Johan told the assembled group that his people would be present and warned the party not to be late. 
as they were to be ferried out on a ship called the Venture as the tide goes out. The High Bishop showed the group to a small antechamber that had been fitted with cots, pointing out that the less people knew of their presence, the better it would be. The group settled in for some rest when a knock on the door came, and Dingus entered. He thanked the party for all that they had done and wanted to let them know that the orphanage had located a building and the children could move out of the sewers again. He pointed out that without the party's help, this could not have been accomplished. You have changed the lives of many, many children, and I cannot thank you enough. The group smiled and reciprocated his appreciation, pointing out that he and the High Bishop were taking a big chance on getting them out of harm's way. As the man lingered, Lady Irena asked him if there was something else. Looking a bit ashamed, he confirmed he had one more favor to ask for the group. He whistled and the girl that the group had met in the jail earlier entered. Dingus explained that the girl was Karina and she too wanted to become an adventurer. The orphan master explained that the girl was too old to remain at the orphanage and could help the party out on their travels. The group looked skeptically at bringing on the waif, but were shocked when Dingus explained that Karina had come up with the escape plan. She is, um, creative, he pointed out. He added that some of the guards had seen her face and she may become a target as well. With that piece of information, the group sighed loudly and Fargus shook his head. Well, we certainly owe you a debt, Karina. May we all live long enough to repay it. The others shook their head and rose to their feet, shaking the little girl's hand. As each thanked her, she turned back to Dingus, who nodded positively. Dingus brought another cot and bedding into the room, and Karina moved to a corner as the foursome discussed the merits of the plan. After a few minutes, they had the waif move in, and Cabe pointed out, Hey, we're all in this together. Come on over and introduce yourself. The group learned that Dingus had found Karina ten years ago when she was only eight. Her mother had died in childbirth and her father perished in a bar fight. She lived on the street for almost a year before the kind man took her in, taught her how to read and write, and clothed her. He is like my second father, the girl confessed. After introducing themselves to her, it was Sister Elaine who suggested that they all get some rest as morning light would be arriving quickly. As the five slumbered, Dingus and the High Bishop sat nervously in the study, hoping that they had made the right choice. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures at Philbar, thanks for listening.